All right, it is time for Kuro, which is definitely a game I'm looking forward to talking about because I really, really liked playing this game. I guess, spoiler, it's going to be an overall positive review, but it's definitely not a game without its blemishes. I think my general observations of the game essentially come down to two things. One, this is the edgy game. <laughs> like, in... I mean, like, you definitely get dark stuff happening in these games. Like, you play the Sky games, and you have Hommel. You have... And then when you play the third, there's Ren's backstory. There's Kevin's backstory. It's not Sunshine and Roses. And then when you get into Crossbell, and then especially into Cold Steel, it... For lack of a better word... It definitely starts getting hornier. It starts getting aware that, wait, we have attractive characters. Let's show off their boobs. Let's have people talk about boobs. Let's have boobs getting played with. Nya, 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 nya. And you're like, okay, like we're, we're doing this. It's not my favorite part, but okay. It's generally really good in spite of that stuff. Kuro is like, okay, so we've talked about boobs. Now we're going to talk just full on about sex orgasms, getting hard, all kinds of shit. You have a lot of, I think it became a point where at least once per chapter, someone dies. And I remember just kind of saying to myself, Hey, look, someone died. Take a shot. Or, Hey, no one's died in this chapter yet. I think we're becoming about to, yeah, there we go. There it is. To the point where I will admit it kind of got a little silly at times. Like it really felt like the people who make trails are like, we're kind of mad that we weren't killing people. Or at the very least, heard the criticisms about how bloodless the Cold Steel series really was in relation to its scale and its stakes. And almost kind of said, okay, you want people to die. It's kind of, a, and from what I understand, Kuro 2 is fucking bonkers with it. I mean, from what I understand, Kuro 2 is... An interesting experiment. I don't know if it's good. I, I mean, I haven't played it. And of course, as soon as I can, I'm dropping everything and playing Kuro 2. I, I feel a little wary of it, but I will say that's more just because of kind of what I've heard from people who have gotten a chance to play it. And that's not at all based on my actual impressions of Kuro 1. But it's definitely the edgy game. And from what I understand, Kuro 2 is the, it's even, edge. it's literally called Crimson Sin, which, does that sound cool? Yes, it also sounds like a very edgy title, if I be completely honest and forthright. My other general observation is, for better and for worse, this is the most unique game in terms of gameplay. I mean, it's... I don't know if it's, like, super unique compared to a lot of other games. Like, it is a turn-based strategy game that also just has some action combat in it. But compared to every other game in the series, this one really stands out for a lot of the things it does. Some of the things it does, I like. Some of them, I think, are fine. Other things, I'm like, why? <laughs> why? <laughs> you had the wheel. Why did you decide to reinvent it? You really did not have to here. This was a dumb decision. And there's other things where I'm like, okay, I'm kind of glad you tinkered with the wheel a little bit. Because it was, I don't know, it kind of needed some grease so it could run a little better. I, I like this. But we'll talk about that more when we get into the gameplay. But going into the presentation... I feel like, aside from, like, the Sky games, this is probably the, like, best-looking any Trails game has looked. Because I will always be a sucker for pixel art and sprites if they're really good. I don't like the game Super Metroid. I don't think it's a fun game, me, myself, personally. I think the game looks phenomenal. I think it's some of the best sprite work I have ever seen. So I'm all about that kind of shit, if, so long as it looks good. This, because I, I think I, I really talked about it in Cold Steel 1 and then a bit in 2, that it looked kind of cheap. And then in 4, I was like, okay, this looks a lot better. Looks a lot smoother. Kuro just looks like that, but a lot better. I feel like the animations are better. The expressions are better. Just the models are better. I still noticed a lot of repeating faces, though. Which is not a huge problem, but it got... Because I remember doing this, like, one side quest. And the quest was about this woman who was being stalked. 
And after we did the quest, I was like, cool, did it, helped the woman out, went about my day. And then later, I saw her walking around town. So I was like, oh, okay, like, I remember her. I'll go kind of talk to her, see what's up, see how she's doing. Was a completely different NPC. But the exact same model, same face, same hairstyle, hair color. I was like, oh, oh, so we are doing this. And then from that point onward, the dam broke. And I was like, man... <laughs> it's like, how was that racist? But you all look the same. There's maybe like five or aside from like major characters. And I get it. Like, it's the background. Like, you know, I'm supposed to notice. But it's also a Trails game where the NPCs are all part of the world building and the community. And one thing, I don't always do this. Like, every now and then I will. But something that people really like about Trails games is you can talk to the NPCs. And generally, after every major story beat, they will have something new to say. It's something that makes the towns feel more alive, the world feel more alive, the game feel more alive. And when you start seeing the same... Again, like in that situation, like, I wanted to go talk to this person, see how she's doing. Completely different person. Like, my immersion in that moment was gone. Not to say it didn't come back, because I think the... Spoiler, like, the game, I think, is really good with its story and its characters and all the shit it's doing. Not 100%, but we'll get to that. But moments like that, I'm like, oh, right. I'm playing a game that, even though it looks a lot better, is probably still very tightly budgeted. Okay. But, I mean, I guess kind of another thing about, like, how good the game looks, I think it really does... I love the colors. There's times where the colors just pop. The thing that comes to mind to me the most is just Aaron's design. He's got like this flaming red hair. He has this really nice white jacket. I'm like, I love the colors of the red and the white. They just look so good. And I think those are the ones that, like I said, really come to mind. But I feel like there's some others too. Like when Rishia shows up, like her hair is just this really nice shade of like violet. Looks super freaking cool. Um... The outfits, as you've heard me talk about, like, in Cold Steel 2 and Cold Steel 4, if there's something I love, it's a nice coat, a nice jacket, all that kind of shit, and everyone's got that. Van's got a coat. Quattro's got this big old thing, like, billowing behind him. Judith has a comfy jacket. <laughs> Aaron's, like, white, like, duster thing that he's got on. Fairy's got one. Anya's, I think, has, like, a... Um, uh, she has, like, a cardigan. Like, I love this shit. Everyone says, this is what appeals to me. Just give me people wearing jackets. And for some reason, that does it for me. That's all you need to have a good character design. Give them a jacket. It's dumb, but I I'm not saying the designs are dumb. I'm saying the fact that this is something I just passionately love. I agree. Like, it's not, it's, it's kind of dumb, but it just appeals to me. It is what it is. Um... I guess a couple other things in addition to the faces being very cut and paste a lot of the time that I noticed that bugged me. One, the UI. Or specifically in combat. Now, the general combat UI, I think, is fine. After, like, a hundred hours of Reverie and then playing these games after only, like, a couple weeks in between, it took me a while to get used to it. And I don't I, I don't think that's really a problem with Kuro. It was just, this is what I was used to. And it's the same as Cold Steel 3 and 4, which were the last two I played before this. So it took a little while to get used to the new stuff. Uh, it is what it is. The turn order UI is awful. It is dog shit in this game. And I, will, I don't understand why they made it look like that. In every other game, it's, all right, here's the turn order. You go, you go, you go. And when you select an action, it clearly shows you, this is where you're going next. If you cast this spell, this is how long it's going to take. But if you cast this spell, this is how long it's going to take. Kuro kind of does that. It's like, here's all your party members. The middle, where someone goes to do their action, and then every and then the other side. So instead of, this is where everyone's going... You very frequently have to, like, hold the button to see, okay, what is the actual turn order? Who is going next? And sometimes, like, it felt accurate, and other times, like, kind of didn't. Like, it was weird. I kind of got used to it by the end of the game. 
But I was also just thinking, why did you do this? This was not a good decision. I hate this. I sincerely hate this. Please don't do this again. From what I understand, Kuro 2 was like, okay, yeah, that was dumb. And they kind of went back to the more traditional turn order screen, which thank goodness. Um, the other thing, oh, yeah, the other thing is just the character portraits. The models look good. And then it's like, yeah, like when a character is uh, talking and you get their, their little portrait in the bottom of the screen, it's just their model. Those look fine. I like that. But for whatever reason, when I'm on the status screen, the portraits look weird. It's, I don't know if it's the art style, but it's something about their faces. They look off, not quite ugly, but just for whatever reason, they all look super unappealing to me. And then again, when I see their models, they all look fine. Like, these guys look great. But something about the way they're drawn there, I'm like, I don't, I don't like this. It's not a major problem, not at all, but it is still something that bothered me, and if I didn't bring it up, I would be, I feel a little dishonest. And the other thing to bring up is the music. It's a Trails game. Music slaps. The opening is fire, and the fact that it is also the final, <laughs> sorry, I noticed, like, the spit coming out of my mouth as I said that. <laughs> I think that is now on video. <laughs> but anyways, um, the opening is fire, and it is also the final boss theme. And it's not just like, oh yeah, like it's a remix of the opening, like it's an orchestral version, it's like a more hype version of the instrumental. It is just, here is the full version of the opening, have at you. And as I've said before, probably my favorite trope in anime and video games is the opening playing during the climax. So like, Kuro, you got me with that one. Uh, like, I liked the battle theme. It took me, because I, I, I had heard it before without playing the game, and I was like, this is fine. And then while playing the game, it's like, oh, okay, I actually kind of dig it. The boss theme, I think, is good. Just, like, kind of some of the overall themes I liked. I remember really liking the music in Long Live, which is the uh, intermission. Very nice, very chill. So good. And the Grim Cats theme, which only plays, I believe, twice. It's so fire! It's so... It's... <laughs> so fun it has so much energy and it's one of those songs I'm like i i wish this played more i sincerely wish and it's like if there was a there's probably a mod where it's like whenever you use judith when you turn into grim cats it just starts playing but um yeah i think the music's really good presentation i would say overall it's a four and a half out of five the problems i have are there they're noticeable I don't think any of them even combine or like, oh yeah, that's a full point off because they're like the portraits, very minor, the recurring faces. It's a minor thing. It doesn't really bother me. The turn order is something that actually bothers me. It's like, that's a half point for sure. The other things to me, they're not even worth half a point, but I feel like I kind of need to bring them up when talking about it. But I think the other stuff in the presentation is just really, 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 really good. Yeah. Sorry, it's really cold in here, so my nose feels, like, really itchy, so I'm probably going to be scratching it and rubbing it a lot, which I know I do in probably most of my videos anyways, but I felt like I really had to bring it up here. Um, so the next one is gameplay, and this is, I mean, I'm going to have a lot to say about the story of Kuro, because there's, it's like an 84-hour game or some shit, there's a lot that happened. But gameplay, I think, is where I'm going to, for sure, be my most critical because they reworked almost everything. Like, this does not play like... It really does not play like any other Trails game. Even when you kind of get used to the flow of combat. Like, oh, okay, like, I know what I'm playing now. Some of the ideas and mechanics... Like, this is weird. This is different. Some of it's good. Some of it's bad. Some of it is... Both? At the same time? Like, um... What do I have here? Sorry, like, I'm just trying to look at my notes, because I, I have a lot for gameplay. So, I think the biggest thing, the, like, real new difference is how they combined the old Sepith system with the more streamlined or dumbed-down, depending on who you ask, court system from Cold Steel. Where you take a quartz, put it into your, uh, put it into your ornament, and it also has a value. And it's, all your quartz will be like, oh yeah, this is, like, your attack buffs, defense buffs more magic, 
Some of them might have additional things too. It's like, oh yeah, like when you get to like low health, you get a speed increase. Here's, um, I'm kind of blanking out. I think there is the one that's like, this one helps with cooking. This one, I think like will grant you a stealth bonus at like the start of combat, you know, all, all that kind of crap. And they also still have color values. And depending on the color values, that does not lead to your spells, but it gives you certain abilities or boosts. Like, you can see treasure chests outside of combat, which always had that one equipped. That's really nice. Or, um, and it's like, oh yeah, when you start combat, you can do maybe additional damage. Or you'll do this much more damage to an enemy, like, when it's stunned. Your spells, like, of this element will do more damage. Or your attacks can sometimes just have an additional effect where they'll do wind damage or fire damage, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Your spells or something completely separate, where what you do is when you go to an ornament shop, you can essentially buy a collection of spells, and it'll have, I don't know, like two, three, maybe four, on, on average, some of them are like very different, free slots, where you open it with Sepeth, you can put in another spell that you have purchased, and that's how you kind of get your customization. It's like, here's your collection of spells with a few free slots in there. So, the Sepith system, I kind of missed it. Like, I still really like the Cold Steel system, don't get me wrong, but I was like, I I miss this. I had some really good times with this, and I enjoy it. There's times where it could feel super limiting, because it's not just like, here's a line, put whatever you want, here's a line, put whatever you want. It's like, okay, this is where you put your offensive shit, your defensive shit, and then, what is it? It's like your magic shit, and then you're like, whatever, like, whatever freebie slots, and sometimes it's like, well, I mean, I really want to put this one here, but now I can't. I really want to put this one right here, but I guess I can't. But that kind of stuff happens in the other systems, too, where it's like, oh, you can only have so many of this type of quartz on this line or this type of quartz on that line. So that wasn't a huge problem. I hate the way spells work. I'm going to say it. What I love about the Trail series is the sheer level of customization and optimization you have when you are doing your builds. I want to be able to say, like, all right, here's, this is the spell I want, and then in Cold Steel, it's like, boom, I have it, because that's what I wanted. Or in the other systems, what crazy shit do I have to put on my character to get this stuff? To make sure I have all of the things that I want. In this game, it's, here you go. Here's a collection of spells. Oh, does is there not enough room to put everything you want on there? Well, get fucked. That's just how it is in this game. I know later in the game, there's uh, like a couple collection. I don't remember what they're called, but like a couple selections of spells or it's like, oh yeah, there's a lot of freebie slots. You still might not get to have everything you want because of some of the ones that are already taken that you may or may not be using. And there's one that's like, all right, this one's completely blank. You can put whatever you want on there. But only one character can get... How do I want to say it? Every, like, spell chip... Because I, they're called, like, cards or chips or whatever. So I'll just call them chips. Every spell chip can only be assigned to one character at a time. So someone is going to be limited. It is just, like, what do you want to give them? And you could say it's like, well, yeah, but I mean, in Cold Steel, you could only give one quartz to a certain person anyways. True... But you could get a lot of copies of that spell. Or like with Master Quartz, it made it, especially with Sub Quartz in Cold Steel 3, 4, and Reverie, it made it a lot easier to say, I want this person to be able to cast these specific spells. It's not super hard in Kuro, because I feel like I have to be honest about that. But it's not as easy as it used to be. Or it's not as easy as it was in those, but... It doesn't feel as, like, satisfying as it was in Sky or Crossbell. It's just, it feels like they tried to kind of keep it streamlined and easy, but they took away, at least for me, some of the customization, especially because the plugins, that's what they call it. Like, you open a slot, you can put in a spell you already own that you, like, had to buy or unlock from, like, doing dumb shit. You can only do that at a service station. Or you have to have beaten chapter four, which is after that, that's the intermission, chapter five, and the final chapter. Because you have a character in your party at that point, he's like, oh yeah, I can just mess with orbments and shit on the go. Which is nice, 
But it also means that, yeah, so if you don't like the just chip of spells that you have and you really want to start messing with your stuff, well, hope you're at an orbit station, buddy, because uh, you can't do that anywhere else. Why? I could do that in Sky wherever I was. I couldn't open slots. That's fine. I get that. I couldn't, like, buy new quartzes. That's fine. But I want to be able to use the shit I have freely whenever I need to. You don't get to do that in Kuro. And it bothered me. I, again, I got used to, I feel like that's something I have to say. All of Kuro's gameplay changes, I got used to them. It doesn't necessarily mean I liked them. I don't like that I had to get used to some of these. Um, oh, the other thing is Master Cortes are no longer a thing. Instead, you have a Hollow Core. And so it does not give you any additional spells. It does give you additional effects. But those effects only kick in when you do something called an S-Boost. So I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit. Just how they rework the S-Craft system. But so when you S-Boost, it's almost like a personalized order. Because it does not affect the whole party. It is just something that affects you. And I I believe it only lasts for three turns. But I think there's some that'll be like, oh yeah, though, like uh, an effect of this holocore is like it'll last for a few more or whatever. That was something I actually kind of liked. Again, I miss Master Quartz's and how they give you a lot of color values or a lot of spells. And I miss Orders because Orders were so fun and just like all the crazy shit you could do. But I don't mind that it's like, we essentially took the idea of orders and made them more personalized. But it's not just, oh yeah, you're a little bit faster or you do more damage. Your hollow core will give you like four or five things. It's like, oh yeah, your magic is going to, when you're boosted, you're going to get a lot less EP, but your spells are going to do ooga booga damage. And like your casting will be a little faster. Or, man, you're going to do a lot more damage. You're going to be a lot faster. Your evasion is going to skyrocket. All kinds of stuff. And I did really like that. But then we have what they did with S-Crafts, which I like and I don't like and I don't understand kind of all the same time. So a part I like is an S-Craft costs 100 CP, which technically it always has. However... In other games, it, let's say you have 137 CP out of a max of 200. You use your S-Craft, it uses all 137, you're left with nothing. But if you get up to 200, you get an additional effect. Kuro, there are no additional effects if you're at 200. It just means you can do it twice. If you have 137 CP, it's like, cool, you used your S-Craft. You have 37 left over. This is wonderful! <laughs> Why didn't you guys ever do this before? I love this! This is great! But then there's the weird shit where... So you have a meter at the bottom of the screen, which is your S-boost. Like, the gauge for it. Which I believe starts at, like, 3. And a character has to be essentially boosted twice. It's like, you boost once, and then you can S-craft which gives them a second, or like they have to be able to boost twice because they could have no boosts, but you have three available. You use an S-Craft, they use two. Every time you use an S-Craft, you get an additional empty gauge or like, I guess an additional slot for a boost for that combat, but it doesn't automatically fill. So essentially their idea is you start with a very limited amount of S-Crafts you can use, but as you keep popping them as the fight goes on, you have the ability to use more and more. And then, you know, it, the system, excuse me, the boost gauge will fill. I, I don't remember exactly how it fills. I think it's just by doing combat, like by doing damage, taking damage, et cetera, et cetera. So essentially for a short fight, it's not going to matter for a long. Sorry, I just got a text. I was looking at it Um, for a long fight or let me just rephrase because that took me out of it for a short fight. The S boosting is not super going to matter. If you're in it for a long haul, like against a boss, especially the final boss, you're going to have a heck ton of like available boosts by the end. I don't mind it, but it's weird because like there are so many times where, like I really just want to be able to S-Craft. I'm boosted. I see another gauge. I'm good. 
and then it, for some reason it wouldn't work. Like, but I'm boosted and I like have one. Like, I, I don't get it. Why is this not available? There's times where I could S break, which means like, hey, it's not your turn, but you can use your S craft because you've got enough boost. You got a hundred CP. I'm like, cool. I don't need to because like it's my turn. I can just pop it without needing to like break. But I, it's like, I can S break, but even though it's my turn and I can use an S craft with this mechanic, I can't just use my S craft. Cause like I would go like, all right, let's look at my crafts, look at my S craft. I, I can't click on it. It's saying I can't use it, but I have enough CP and I have enough boosts available. Why can I S break, but not just use it normally? What the fuck? I don't get it. And that never made sense to me. This happened throughout the entire game. You can S break with this exact character, but they cannot S-craft on their turn, and then at some point later, like, yeah, they can S-craft on their turn now. What's, what happened? Like, because what would make sense to me is on your turn, if you have 100 CP, you can S-craft. Nothing else matters. You can only S-break once you've boosted, because essentially you're trying to cheat the system and game the system, so you have to do, like, a little bit of other legwork. That makes perfect sense to me. But it's almost kind of weirdly the opposite, and it's this bizarre mechanic that is encouraging you to use your S-Crafts, but limiting you on how you use your S-Crafts, so you'll hopefully use more of them later? Yeah, like, I, the more I'm explaining it, the less sense it's making to me, because as I was playing, I was like, this doesn't really make sense. It's, it, like, again, I like... S boosting and like the personalized order thing. I like using a hundred CP for an S craft and that's it. Everything is left. But some of the ways, other ways it's implemented, like I don't really get it. It's okay. Mm -hmm. But then you have the way you move where instead of in a grid, you have like kind of free movement. You can't always move throughout the entire arena, just depending on how much actual movement your character has, but it's just something that flows a little better. Like, oh wait, yeah, this is a really good idea. Why wasn't this a thing before? Thanks, Kuro, you're fantastic. Um, there's the action combat, which I do have to talk about, but there's just not much to say. It's very bare bones. You can attack, you fill up a meter, which gives you a stronger attack, and you can dodge roll. That's it. You can't use crafts. You can't use arts. You just attack, dodge, and if you get a perfect dodge, your meter fills automatically, and you can do your stronger attack. Uh, if you hit an enemy enough, you can essentially kind of break it, which then you can... Because um, you can go in and out of turn-based combat and action combat whenever you want, generally speaking. Excuse me, there are uh, bosses, only turn-based, no action stuff, and if an enemy gets the drop on you, it will be a little while before you can, um, like, go back to regular combat. They will just be like, no, I am starting turn-based, you're at a disadvantage, you're getting bopped. Um, it's fine, it's kind of fun, I feel like it's fun in small doses, but the characters feel very samey, even though their weapons, completely different. Like, their fighting style should be completely different. I'm like, I'm just kind of sitting here mashing X, circle, and then R2 when my gauge is full. And that's it. This is kind of boring. Like, when I learned that, like, there was this kind of, com like, action combat, I was like, yo, like, I can be casting spells here. I could just be doing crafts. Crazy shit. Like, yo... Maybe it's almost kind of feel like a Kaseki fighting game, and it just doesn't. It's it's not something I'm going to take any points off of, because I don't dislike it. It does not detract from my experience in any way. But I'm not adding points either, because it doesn't really enhance the experience in any way. It just feels... It feels kind of like they're like, hey... Dark Souls is really popular, so let's try and do something. Like, let's try to modernize Kiseki a little bit by adding some of that in there. Which, I don't... I'm not going to say it didn't work, but I don't think it super helped either. 
From what I understand, in Kuro 2, they added arts into this, which I think would help. I don't know if they added crafts. If in Kuro 3, because from what I understand, like, Kuro 2 ends with, like, to be concluded in Kuro 3. If it is, like, yes, you can, uh, you get this basic shit, you can cast arts, you can use your crafts. I would actually, like, really look forward to be able, uh, looking forward to be able to do that. Um, I'm gonna go and end this part here. I mean, it's not really going to matter super much. Essentially, the video's going to be like, yeah, I'm going to end this here, and then I'm just going to keep going, but my food's ready, so I'm really excited to eat some steak. Okay, so back. Uh, food was really good, and to segue in, so is the gameplay to Kuro. I know I've talked about some of my complaints, some of what I think are the oddities, but at the end of the day, what really matters is, even with the complaints, did I have fun? And I did. I think, like, just fighting mobs is fun, but the game really shines during boss fights. I think, um, like, pretty much most of it's, like, fighting the big monsters, it's fun. A lot of the end boss fights in chapters are really fun. Chapter 5, in general, absolutely shines. In terms of gameplay, I think it is one of the best chapters of the entire series, it reminds me a lot of chapter, um, I believe it's chapter 7 of SC, where you go through all the towers, and you have to fight the enforcers. It's basically the same thing. So, like, yeah, here's a lot of characters that have been introduced, hyped up, as major players. Not just the members of Almalta, but also, like, um, depending on who you side, because you get, with all the different factions, you get to side with a faction. So you could side with, um, Rishia and Sal with the Bracers, which in this game is Zinn, Fee, and Elaine. You can side with Ouroboros, and you get Walter and Letty as party members, although they are non-controllable. And uh, what's the other faction? Uh, shoot, because I know there's four factions. Oh, or uh, Ikaruga, which is the new ones, which is Shizuna and uh, her guy uh, Kurogane. And I did Rishia and Sal because Rishia's my homie. Like, she was one of my MVPs in, um, in Reverie. Is like, if, if Rishia's available, I kind of got to do it. But I was really, really close to making Shizuna. I'll talk about her fight in a second. But you fight all those other parties. It's like, okay, so here's the people you side with. Cool. You have a quick fight with them to make sure it's like, all right, are you strong enough to team up with us? Kind of dumb shit, which I love. After that, though, it's like, all right, now fight the other teams. And they're such fun fights. And then after you do all that shit, here's an Almata fight, which you fought this person before, but I kind of get to fight him again. And it's so damn fun. And it's all so satisfying. I love it. Anytime you're doing like the Grendel fights, they're really fun. And then you can redo the Grendel fights without using Grendel. So you're like, oh, this is a lot harder. And they're so fun. And then... The, like, creme de la creme... Well, I, I feel like I also have to shout out the Gerard fight. Because at the end of Chapter 5, it's like you've been... You fight refight the Almada members, and then you fight their boss, and he's also a good fight. Like, he's one of the tougher fights. I played the game on Nightmare, by the way. He, I think, was one of the... I don't think he killed me, but I was like, this is one where... Excuse me. It definitely got a little shaky at times. I don't think I need, like, everyone down had to send out the B team or anything. I was like, oh, okay. I have to be a little more careful around this guy. This is a good fight. The creme de la creme fight in the game to me is Shizuna. No question. I never lost to her. But I actually, I want to say I refought her more. Because I, like, refought all the bosses I could to get the achievement. I think I did Shizuna's an additional time because it was just so fun. That is one of my favorite fights in the series, I'm not gonna lie. She's a very fun character, and the fact she's like, oh yeah, you know, since we're already here, and I'm a badass, and you guys seem really strong, well, let's just spar, let's just have fun. And she is so, like, ridiculously fast, ridiculously strong. There were parts in the fight where literally all she did for her turn was just move towards somebody, and it scared the crap out of me! <laughs> Like, uh, uh, what's she doing? Get away from me, she devil! <laughs> I love her. I love everything about this character, and she was so fun to fight. 
because a lot of the fights, even as, as fun as they were, I was like, this is not super hard. It's kind of easy. In a nightmare, they just have so much health. They're like, this is just unreasonably tanky. And there's still a challenge. I'm still having fun with it. But I am getting a little too far. I'm like, I'm just kind of waiting for the fight to end. Shizuna was one of the only ones where I'm like, I kind of don't want this to end. Because she is giving me a run for my money. Like, I have to be incredibly careful every single turn. I don't know what the fuck she's going to do. Um, when it comes to the individual characters, the MVPs for me are Van, because, you know, he's Unga Bunga, and when he can go Grendel, it's really useful. Anyas, for just how much Ooga Booga damage she was doing, and also, you know, being the main healer. And Judith. I actually thought Judith was a very good character, like a very strong character to use. I used quite a bit of Aaron. I think, like, my main four were those three... Aaron and Quatra. I know I just named five people, but it was just kind of depending on the situation who I would swap out. But generally, those five, Fairy, I've had her just like do a lot of supporting stuff. So it was kind of an every now and then swap her in when she was needed. Uh, Reset, I used early on, like when she was available for like a chapter or two. As again, kind of like, all right, she's not, she's kind of like a backup caster, both for support and offense. But I never felt like she was great in either role, but she was solid. Um, who am I forgetting? Am I just forgetting Brigard? Because I, I he, he was fine. I just, I never really used him. He's just there. But yeah, I, I think that's everyone. Yeah, because there's like my main five plus three, because I believe it is eight total. So yeah, that, that that's about right, but... With the exception of Brigard, he was just kind of there. Everyone, I, to me, they had their uses in the party. But there was a clear A-team, more or less. And then here's kind of my B-team. But then we get to the final chapter. Which, if chapter 5, in terms of gameplay, is one of the best in the whole series, the finale, I think it's one of the worst. I... Did not have fun playing the final chapter. I'm going to be completely honest about it. So, you know, the first kind of some story stuff happens, which is all very pleasant. I'll talk about that a little later, but that's really nice. But I was like, all right, plot stuff is happening. Pandemonium, hell on earth. You're separated from your party members. You got to get everyone back, which generally is a trope I absolutely love. I'm a big fan of both the dwindling party and the, all right, I got to get all my party members back, which is why I love the first half of Cold Steel 2, or I guess maybe the first third or so of Cold Steel 2 so much. I was like, all right, go to this area of the city, fight some demons. You get a guest character, which it, it changes throughout. Like you get Shizuna at one point, Fee, Rishia, uh, an uncontrollable Walter, which shout out to that. The fact that Walter, like, he literally joins because Ren gets captured by, like, some demon shit, and he's like, that little girl is in trouble? I am in. I don't care that Zen is right here, and me and Zen are always on site. I don't care that this means I am technically helping Zen out with something. That little girl is a treasure, and she deserves every good thing that happens to her. If she is in trouble, I am there no questions asked. I was like, man, Walter, you a real one for that. I was like, you know, I haven't seen you since Sky, and you didn't leave a great first impression when you were talking about how you wanted to, like, bash Tita's brains in. Fuck you. But you know what? You know what? You and I are good now. We're, we're good after that. Also, the fact that Ren was never a playable character in this game, it's not like I was like, wow, this is dumb. This rubs me the wrong way. But it was just really? I mean, in chapter five, she's like, yeah, I'm kind of here as like a neutral party. Like I'm, you know, kind of helping out everybody. I'm like, I don't know. Doesn't that just mean you could have joined us at any time? Like, I, I guess you're mission control, but you could have been playable at this time. And then in the final chapter, you could have been playable. Let's be real. Oh, I also didn't bring up Elaine as a guest character. <laughs> So, this might end up being a recurring theme, I don't know, where I mention how Cold Steel 3 Toa, like, from that game onwards, Toa is my Trails crush, but 
damn, there's some other really good women in this series. Elaine is one of them. You know, like, she's beautiful, don't get me wrong. She's very attractive. Like, she's so cool, so badass. Anytime I got to play as Elaine or anytime she just got spotlighted, it's like, this is a really good part of the game. Absolutely loved her. I had so much fun playing at her. Um, it's not super, it's not like it's super often, but it's often enough that I'm like, I, she's almost like an unofficial main party member, but just, I would say the amount of times you get to play out of her, she's really freaking cool. I, I wish she could have been a permanent member in the final chapter, especially right before the final boss. Given the circumstances, I think it would have made a lot of sense. I get why they didn't, but I mean... I I think it would have worked. I honestly do. Um, oh yeah, but I was just talking about why I don't really like playing the final chapter. So, like I said, I love generally having to get the party back, but these areas to me felt super cut and paste. One or two is fine, but having to do like five or six of them, or however many there were, I got bored. I got bored really fast. I like the guest members I get to use. I think they're really cool but I still got bored. Then, when you finally get everybody, you do a couple fights. Elaine joins, so always a highlight. Then you get to do the final dungeon. As a dungeon, it's fine. It's just, it, I love its aesthetic. I think it's really interesting how, like, the world is literally going to hell, but the aesthetic is like you're almost ascending into heaven. I, I appreciated that, but it's... Actually, kind of the opposite of the final dungeon of Zero, where it's you're essentially descending into hell. But, I mean, the enemies were just like, yeah, they're cool, I guess. They're kind of whatever. But what are the bosses? It's the members of Amata. Again. Again. <laughs> because when you fight them in Chapter 5, uh, for, what are, what are their names... Uh, Viola, I think it's like Viola and Alexander, that is the second time you fight them. So in the finale, it is the third time you are fighting them. Olympia, you fight twice in Chapter 4. So by the time of the finale, this is your fourth time fighting this character. And it's like the fifth time you fight Melchior, and his fight is the exact fucking same. He does all this, he's like, I'm now a demon, ah, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, okay, like, his fight's gonna be different. No, he's just a little weaker to the higher elements, and I think that was it. Now, arguably, it's not even arguably, it's like the one thing is you're dealing with different combinations of people. Now, instead of, because uh, you fought Viola by herself and with Alexander, now you're fighting her with Olympia. You fought Alexander with Viola and by himself, and now he's with, who was he with? I'm, oh, I forgot, oh yeah, I completely forgot about Big Axe Man, because you also fight him in Chapter 5, and then he's like this recurring thing where like, if you take too long, he'll just like show up and fight you. Fuck that guy, I love him. Like his personality is so much fun, he's an absolute madman, and like, his fights are also ones, I think it was like the, I, I think it was the last time you fight him in Chapter 5, was a nightmare. Like, he was so fast. He was doing so much damage. It was one of those where, like, I didn't lose, but boy, it was tough. Absolutely loved that. But yeah, you fight him several times in Chapter 5, and now you gotta fight him again, because he's the one that's paired with Alexander. And because I had already fought these characters so many times, at least, for most of them, this was at least the third time I was fighting them, I was bored, because, like, I've seen this. What do you have that's new? Melchior, what do you have that's new? You have weaknesses. That's it. You're not doing new crazy shit. This is getting boring. Because y'all's stories, like, came... With the exception of Melchior, who kind of gets through it, you came to satisfactory endings in Chapter 5. Why are you doing this again? You're overstaying your welcome. And as great as Chapter 5 is, its greatness to me is kind of why Chapter, like, the finale fails. Because, like, this was... I don't want to say it's a perfect ending, but it's a perfect ending for several of these people. Like, if uh, if in the finale it's just Melchior and he brings back Gerard, 
that's fine. Because you've only fought Gerard once. I don't mind fighting him again. And honestly, I really liked his last fight. Like, before you get to the final couple bosses. Because I remember that fight. My team died. And then I had to use the B team. And I was like, uh-oh. Uh-oh. Like, okay, Quatre is kind of like... He's part of the A team. It just kind of like, I didn't have him out when everyone else was dead. But, boy, Fairy doesn't do a lot of damage. She is just here to support Reset, she's got some stuff on her, but she's not for damage. And man, Brigard's just not very good. Oh, this is gonna be bad. And we made it through. And I was like, I'm so proud of you. The B team came through. Let's go. Let's go. Like, I loved that. But man, those other cut and paste areas and these same exact fights again, it was, it was boring. It was a slog. And then I get to the final bosses. <sighs> I fucking hated them. So the first one has this mechanic where it'll just target a party member. And then after a couple turns, they're gone. They're just out of combat. You can't bring them back. So they're like, oh, I guess I have to start with my B team. Because if I start, because uh, you won't do that once you get to only four people left. It's like, okay, I guess I have to start with the B team now because... My A team can just be gone. This is stupid, and I hate this. Again, because uh, I'm playing on Nightmare, very tanky, has a move where he's just like, cool, I'm going to buff myself and get a fuck ton of HP back. I think it's like 10,000 or something. Uh, it might have been more. He can use it multiple times, like in a row, if he has multiple turns. Surrounded by enemies that are also very tanky, can do quite a bit of damage. The attacks that they all do will generally hit everybody, it was just rough. It was one of those where, like, I'm constantly... Um, my turns are not spent attacking. I have to either heal or set up my shields, which don't... Like, my health and shields don't last very long because they either will all cancel and get rid of my shields or just do so much damage to everybody that I can't do anything about. And then the second phase is like, cool, you get Van back. Yay! Also, go do all of that again. All that damage you just did to all, I think it gets a lot more health, I could be misremembering that, but it's like, yeah, fuck you, like, he's not gonna snap his fingers and get rid of your party again, that's nice, but the damage is just absurd, uh, his S-Craft killed everybody, I think it was, even if I had, like, shields up, and for me, because I had a Aegis shield, which I think was 3,000 additional hit points, it would, like, one-shot pretty much my entire party, so I was like, I'm, on an invisible timer, because I have no idea when the S-Craft is coming. I just have to do whatever I can. Oh, look, he! I just did... I was making steady progress, and then he snapped his fingers, healed like 13,000 or whatever HP, and like I feel like I did... Oh, look, he just did it again, so I have literally accomplished nothing. Wow, this is not fun. This is awful. That last section of the game is so... Like, incredibly unfun. It almost kind of negates... It... I don't know if I really want to say it does negate, like, how good Chapter 5 is. But the fact that it is my last impression of Kuro and its gameplay. And it was boring. Boring. Hey, I really like this fight. Awful. Ugh, it's not good. So for me, when it comes... Uh, I don't know if I actually gave a number for the presentation for Kuro. Just in case I didn't... It's a four and a half out of five. You know, because I did. Because I was like, yeah, like these aren't major problems. I still got to bring them up. For me, Kuro's gameplay is weird. Some of it I don't like. Some of it I like enough. Pretty much all of it I got used to. So like, I, I got to take off a little bit. But the final chapter sucks. From a gameplay perspective, narrative perspective, I think it's fine. From a gameplay perspective, it's awful. And I really hate to say that. I hate that that's how I feel about it. To me, it is a three and a half out of five gameplay. And it loses, like, all the other kind of, yeah, I don't really care for this. It's weird to me. That's like half a point total. Because I still had fun and still got used to it. So if I'm being honest... I really can't deduct that many points. 
the final chapter is an entire point taken away. I wish I could mitigate that with how good chapter five is. But to me, that's also kind of what makes it so bad. It was like, this was perfect. And then you just kept going. These fights overstayed their welcome. And then the final boss was awful. It's... Uh. So when talking about the narrative of Kuro no Kiseki, I have to start by just talking about the members of the Orc Ride Solutions office. I said before, the Liberal crew, my favorite cast amongst, um, <clears throat> excuse me, Trails protagonists. New Class 7, I have as a definite second place. Arc Raid Solutions Office is next, and they make a pretty, like, a, not a, like, super strong argument, but definitely make an argument for actually being second place. Although I am going to stick with New Class 7 here. I really like this crew. Now, I won't lie, they're not, I, I feel like there are some that are weaker than others. Burgard is just there. Like, he should, like, he seems like he's a pretty cool guy, but... He's just kind of in the background, chilling. It very much feels like, this is y'all's story. I'm just kind of here to support. And that's not inherently a bad thing, but I don't find him super interesting, although he is pretty cool. Reset, she's a super hyper-competent maid, which is a trope I really enjoy whenever I see it. Again, I love Sharon from Cold Steel. I think there's moments where, when they talk about like how human she is or isn't, I think it's really interesting. But aside from that, I don't like her as much as the other cast, but I do like her. And then Quatre, I also think is okay. I don't dislike him by any means. I don't hate him at all. But I think he's all right. <clears throat> then you get the other five. Van has just my favorite personality of this crew because he's just Gintoki. <laughs> he's had some shit go on in his past. He's now running an odd jobs business. He lives on top of a bistro. He loves sweets. <laughs> like, the only real difference between them is Van also likes saunas and cars and Gintoki doesn't. That's it. Like, like especially because I, I started playing Kuro, like, the night after I finished Gintama, I was like, this is just Gintoki. This is amazing. I love this dude. Um, Anyas is my favorite just in terms of uh, combat ability. Not to say I dislike her character, though. The two things about Anyas that really stick out to me, one, she is a prude, <laughs> which I think is really funny. So, like, I've, I believe I talked about it with both Elisa and Ellie, there's moments where they come across as very kind of soon today and possessive. Like, oh, you're looking at another girl, Reen or Lloyd? Why? I'm here. Come on. And they both have a lot of moments like that that I just don't find endearing. Anyas kind of has those moments, but for me, they feel less of, why are you looking at another girl when I'm here, Van? Uh, and almost just more of, dude, why are you like this? Here's a great example. Um, so they're going, so they're, it's in chapter three, which is the film festival. And at the, like that night, every, like the girls are going to bed and Aaron's like, Van, come on, let's go hit a strip club. And Van's like, ah, I mean, sure. Why not? We're in town. You need a chaperone, kiddo. I'll, I mean, Aaron's like 19 or 20 or something, but he's like, yeah, I'll, I'll go make sure like nothing crazy happens. So they go, go to a strip club, have some fun hang out with another uh, major character of the arc, get into a fight with Judith because Judith sees them with this girl. They're like, ah, you you horrible men. You're probably trying to accost her and attack her. No, we're, we're literally not. She's actually a friend of ours. No, I don't believe you. And then you get to a fight and the Grimcats theme plays, which is fantastic. And then afterwards, Judith's like, oh, I'm I'm sorry, I'm, that was kind of dumb of me. Like, yeah, you're a fucking retard. <laughs> Judith gets roasted constantly throughout the game this poor woman it just never stops but anyways point van and aaron come back and the girls are all awake like hey guys where were you you're at a strip club assholes see uh the thingy activated like the genesis activated so we didn't know if anything crazy was going on we were trying to find you guys had no idea where you were didn't know if you were safe and then Reset tells us it's because you went to a strip club. So all of me being worried for your asses was for absolutely nothing. I'm like, you know what? I like that. 
Because to me, it does not feel that Anyas is mad because they were looking at other girls. It's, guys, there's a time and place for this, and this was not the time or the place. I really appreciate that. And I feel like that's kind of what... All right, so there's another scene in the intermission when everyone's, like, taking a bath. And so you've got uh, Van and Aaron on one side where Aaron's like got his hair down. He's all wet. And he's like, oh, I bet seeing me like this gets you hard, old man. Talking to Van because that's the kind of dialogue you get in Kuro. Like I said, this is the edgy game. And Van's like, no, I am not getting hard. The girls hear this on the other side. And then Fairy's like, hard? Hey, Anyas, what do you think they're talking about? And Anyas has this look on her face like, I'm going to kill Aaron. The next time I see him, I'm going to look this man into the windows of his soul. And I am going to cast every single art I know, and he is going to explode. There is going to be nothing he can do about it, and the world will be a better place. I think that's hilarious. Again, to me, it doesn't come across as, oh, he's like flirting with Van. I hate him. And it just comes more across of, why? Why are you guys like this? I have to explain this to Fairy. I have to explain this to the child. Just... Why? Why me? What did I do to deserve this? I think it's great. The other thing I like about her is she is a fast learner. She comes across at first as like, you know, the very naive and innocent character amongst a group of people who have kind of done or seen some shit. And she starts to adjust to that pretty quickly. She becomes really good at picking up on information, not giving out more information than is necessary, negotiating tactics. I appreciate that. I'd argue Anyas might have the best character development out of anyone in this cast for that reason. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I wanted to say about Anyas. I don't think so, but if I think of something up, I will bring it up. Uh, Fairy is precious and hilarious. <laughs> so she has this recurring uh, character trick. I try to say tick and trade at the same time. Uh, but her character tick is sometimes someone will say something and she won't quite understand it. And so she'll repeat it back, but it's wrong. For example, there's a character, I can't remember his name, which I hate because he's one of my favorite side characters, but he's the racer guy. If you play Kuro, you know what I'm talking about. He is a Z1 formula racer. So whenever Fairy hears that, she goes Z1 and it's spelled Z-E-E -E, and then like one was spelled out. sorry i almost went really weird for a second but o n e even though whenever they say it, it's spelled z and then the number one so that happens a few times my two favorites is it's after the strip club scene and Rosette's like oh van you're being quite mendacious about this to which fairy says Man delicious. I laughed so hard at man delicious. I was howling at the mood after I read that. The other one, again, it's something Rosette says. I don't remember it quite. It was like, oh, like, yeah, this company, they're like a multi-corporational organization. She says something like that. And I'm very, was like, like, uh, what was it? It was something like multiple orgasms. <laughs> and again, I was laughing so hard because she has no idea what the hell she's talking about. Like, what I love about Fairy is she's always so excited about stuff. Like, one of my favorite scenes between her and Anya's, it's like, Fairy's just joined the party. You're doing some patrolling. I think you're going into the sewers, which ends up being when you first fight Grim Cats and the theme plays. So, they're kind of discussing, like, all right, how do we want to do this? Like, uh, do we want to go... And blah, blah, blah. Anya's like, okay, fairy, this is what we're going to do. You know, we're going to go into the sewers. We're going to take, like, I think there's like a monster quest. Like, all right, so we don't really know exactly where it is in the sewers, what it can do. So we're going to go in nice and slow and cautious, kind of take things as they come. Like, do you get what I'm saying? Yeah, I 100% say what you're, understand what you're saying, Anya's. We're going to run in, guns blazing, and kick its ass. Yeah, fairy, that's not at all what I said. I don't understand how you can say you understand me and get the complete opposite response. I think it's hilarious, and I love it. Aaron, I think, has my favorite individual story, because chapter two is just the Aaron chapter, and I think it's fantastic. I'll be honest, I don't remember a lot of the individual beats, but I remember my feeling as I was playing it and as I was playing the rest of the game, being like, I loved this arc. It reminded me a lot of Agate, um, the red-haired wild rager. Which, so, yeah, I think Ash is the only wild rager that doesn't have red hair, and even then he 
kind of has red hair. Oh, no, a Gaius. Gaius also has wild rage, and he does not have red hair, so never mind. It's just Agate, Randy, and um, Aaron. I just said his name. A.A. Ron, as I also frequently called him because I love me some Kia Peele. Anyways, point. It was just, he is this really angry thug orphan, has his kind of like his own like gang of droogs that he is the leader of, but he ends up losing most of them and he's just so consumed by his anger. But he, they're, you know, the main characters are kind of able to help him through it, help him get over it, and then he ends up joining the party. I really liked it. I thought it was very well done. Basically, though, after his chapter, with the exception of a few scenes, like when you're um, like interacting with members of Amalta, he's just kind of the edgy character. Like he's the one that will frequently make the sex jokes, and for a while, it's like, man, he's like a really good character. And now it feels like they don't really know what to do with him aside from this brand of humor, which isn't awful. But I'm kind of starting to feel disappointed because I felt like there was like he was so good and so interesting, and then I felt like they you know they kind of brought it back. Like there's again some really good moments here and there, but I feel like his arc is probably my favorite. So when I look at this cast, I'm like, all right, my favorite overall personality, gameplay, story arc, all of that stuff. Like overall, that would be Judith of the main cast because I think she kind of has the best of everything. I think she is a fun character. I think she's really good in combat. She and Burgard both join really late, but while Burgard just shows up kind of out of the blue, Judith has been a character throughout the game. So you get to know her, her personality, the way the other cast interact with her, which is they either roast her, pity her, or they pity her and they roast her. And I'm like, this poor woman is just getting bullied the entire game. I feel so bad for her. Like, I think the first time you meet Grimcats, they're like, oh, she's the Phantom Thief. Van sees her, sees her kind of skimpy out, and is like, oh, you're the Phantom Whore. And they, they slut shame the hell out of her. And a lot of the times when they bully her for just doing things that are kind of dumb, I think it's funny. I don't think the slut shaming is funny. I'm going to be completely honest. I'm just like, you guys are just being assholes. She doesn't deserve this. But overall, I think Judith is a ton of fun, and I think she was a ton of fun to play. When it comes to the side characters, I already talked about Elaine. I think Elaine is great. Elaine is also not my only crush from this game, because Letty is phenomenal. She's not on screen very often, but anytime she does, I'm like, she does it for me. <laughs> she really does it for me. Shizuna is fantastic. Anytime she is on screen, she steals the show. Um, again, I don't remember the name of the racer, but I really liked him. I loved his storyline. The um, people at the bistro, again, I don't quite remember the names. I think Yume was the name of the uh, the daughter. I don't remember the name of the mom, but I liked them. I liked their storyline. Dingo Brad, which, goofy ass name. Let's be real for a second. <laughs> apologies <laughs> to anyone named Dingo Brad. <laughs> to me, it's like a Wazy Hemisphere kind of name, but Dingo is great. Like, this guy's, like, really, like, he's a cool dude. I like him. I like a lot of his interactions. I love his interactions with uh, the reporter. Muriel, I think was her name. I liked her a lot. My boy Dingo, though. Like, I'll talk about the actual story of the game here in a second. If you've played it, you know why I'm shouting him out. My man. Um, the antagonists of the game, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, because I don't remember the L, it's either Almalta, Almata, or it's Amalta. I don't quite remember, I think it's Amalta. We'll just call them A, because that's what they're referred to early in the game. A is fantastic. What I love about A is they are mentioned in the prologue, and they are the antagonists throughout the entire game. You get to meet more of the members. You get to hate more of the members because these guys are so hateable. And it's fantastic. Melchior, absolute cunt, 100%. But he steals every scene he's in because he's having the time of his life. And like in chapter five, when you're fighting these people and dealing with these people, you're getting backstories. 
you understand why Viola is the way she is. Alexander, all he has to say is, I'm from North Ambria. You understand everything about this guy. The other dude, whose name I don't remember, is like Oryx or something? I Like, anytime he's on screen, he's having fun. His backstory is very interesting. Like, I liked this. But while their backstories explain why they are the way they are, they don't make them sympathetic. And I love that. I love how, uh, I think specifically, like, Fairy and Aaron, when they hear Viola's backstory, they're like, okay. And? Like, I, okay, I get it. I get why you do what you, like, why you are the way you are. It does not make me sympathize with you. It does not make any of the things you have done to other people okay. We are going to fucking kill you. And you have the choice in chapter five. Do you want to kill them? Or do you want to let them live and just capture them? Which then in the finale, it's like, well, it doesn't really matter. They all are there and available anyways. It's weird. I will say for me, I killed Viola. I did not kill Alexander because when he's like, I want to die, kill me. I'm like, no, 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 no. You live. That's worse for you. I did not kill Olympia because she's the only one I feel sorry for because her whole thing is she's been like mind controlled. That poor woman. Oryx, I don't think you got a choice. You just kind of killed him. Gerard, you just kill him. And the Melchior, you never get a choice because you don't really fight him like that in chapter five. Um, I haven't talked about Trails from Zero yet. What I loved about A is how they fixed my problem with the antagonist from Zero. Because in Zero, I felt like there was a lot of opportunities. You could have introduced the cult a lot earlier. I would say, I think it's chapter, chapter one or chapter two. It's the one with Ernest where like he, at the Yin chapter. Cause at the end, you can clearly tell, okay, this guy's like hopped up, uh, hopped up on something. There's drugs involved. And from there, it's like, oh, okay, well, the drugs, Gnosis, the cult, we're aware of this shit. You can kind of, like, the, the characters could have started building something. Obviously, like, not Lloyd. Lloyd doesn't know what the fuck is going on. But Dudley, the chief, Tio can maybe add something here. And you can start building up that there is a cult. They are fucking dangerous. We don't know who the members are. We don't know how many of them there are. So it starts to become a mystery where you don't know who to trust. Instead, it's literally the last chapter. Hey, by the way, so here's all this backstory about a cult, and someone's probably part of it, and uh, it's this guy. With A, they are built up the entire game. These are the villains, slowly kind of piecing together what they're doing and who they are. I think it works so much better. And again, they're so hateable and it's so good oh let's see that side characters and then i guess just kind of going through the plot i think the prologue when you get the first genesis is just van and anius does a very good job of establishing your plot you are trying to collect the MacGuffins. you're trying to collect all the genesises of establishing who van is and who anius is chapter one which is trying to find the missing jaeger core i think overall it's good it's all right phenomenal ending. Holy crap, I love the ending of that chapter. It is so freaking good. Chapter two, like I said, that's the Aaron chapter. I really like that story arc. Excuse me. Uh, chapter three is the film festival. I thought it was a lot of fun. I really, I don't remember it being like as engaging as chapter two, just in terms of the plot. But again, it's a film festival. This is a lot of fun. I, and that's one of my favorite jokes in the game where Judith joins the party temporarily just as pure Grimcats. Pretty much everyone in the main party at this point can put two and two together and knows who she is. Poor Anya hasn't caught on yet. But when she joins, the game just kind of gives you a message saying, Judith, and then it like interrupts like after the D, Grimcats in all caps has joined the party. It's like, whoa, whoa, wait, wait, it's not Judith. This is the character. I was like, that's freaking hilarious. I love that. Chapter four is the uh, abusive professor and learning more about like why he's doing what he's doing. That's the Quatre chapter. I think it's okay. I don't I don't think it's bad by any means, but I just wasn't as invested in it. Chapter five, or no, excuse me, the intermission. Intermission is fantastic. 
That and Chapter 5 are, like, the best two parts of the game for me. As much as I was saying I love Chapter 2, I think Chapter uh, Intermission and Chapter 5 are just that much better. Two of the best chapters in the whole series. Mwah, mwah, two chef's kisses. Uh, just the reason I love the intermission is a it's an intermission, so it's it's very low key, it's chill. I love it. You get the conversation with Rocksmith, which I love. You get my racer boy, his story, which is really good. I was so invested in it, like dead ass, one hundred percent. Like this is probably one of my favorite like quest lines in the series. This is fantastic. Really want to know where this goes. I I'm rooting for him, man. It's like this is a dude who has made his mistakes. 100%. But I feel like he genuinely wants to make up for it. And the people he's hurt are willing to give him that chance, but are kind of making it clear that, you, like, I have not forgotten what you've done. I've forgiven you, but I haven't yet forgotten. You have to earn my trust back. I really, really like that. Uh, I think I just mentioned, like, the conversation with Rocksmith, which I thought was really good. You get Judith as a party member, and then you get to fight Shizuna, and she's introduced. And like, ah, that's good. And then, because I had realized, like, no one's died in the intermission yet. Okay, I guess this is the exception. <gasps> nope! <laughs> Never mind, because that's when the kaboom happens, where the village you go to in Chapter 1, where you meet all these nice people, all these lovely people... You go save a cat, and then the there's the kid who's like, I want to become a bracer, and I want to help people. They're all dead. They all exploded, because A is, they're all cunts, 100%. These are evil fucking people. And our boy Dingo, knew shit was up, went to the town, confronted Gerard, and was like, okay, he's going to do this. Everyone is going to die. I am going to die. I am going to give as much information about this as possible. My man went out like a boss. I cried at the end of the intermission. I can't lie. It is the only time in the series where I've cried and had nothing to do with the Sky series. It's um, it's when Muriel is specifically like she comes in, she's crying and lets them know that Dingo was in there. That part got me. Can't lie. Chapter 5 starts by showing what happened in the town and what happened to Dingo. And chapter 5 is literally all about, this just happened. These people are completely irredeemable. We now know where they are. Go get them. While also being this giant game tournament arc, which is hype as hell, so I loved it. You've got Elaine kind of going rogue and doing her own interesting shit and getting over her back sort of like, fuck, this is so good, this is so cool! And then you've got Ren interacting with former members of Ouroboros, because yeah, I think this is when like Elroy is introduced. Like, like he and Letty have shown up a time or two before, but now they're formally introduced, like, oh, these two are cool. And then, yeah, there's a part where the two of them and Walter just casually hanging out with Ren. Like, this is great! This is lovely! Fuck, this part of the game is so good! Um... Yeah, and then, uh... And you get the finale? It's alright. Oh, okay, yeah, now, I take that back. So, the first half of the chapter, where you have this big party, because A's been defeated, as far as you know, you beat chapter 5. It's lovely, it's great, I adored it. Then after, you get a special side quest where a lot of the people you have helped throughout the game just kind of throw Van a nice party and give him a lot of, like, give him a lot of sweets. Like, this is our thank you and appreciation. It was lovely. It was great. I was like, what's the, um, Michael Rosenberg, I think? They're like, ah, oh, in the mouth. It was lovely. <laughs> like, that is the first half of the final chapter. And then... Pandemonium, hell on earth is like, hey, remember all the people that you either killed or imprisoned from A? Well, they're either brought to life or magically escaped, and it's not really super explained. I'm like, I mean, it's the Genesis, it's allowed to do magic bullshit. I get it. I'm like, well, that kind of cheapened that shit because I feel like these were good, solid endings here. Okay, and okay, I guess Van has a demon in him now, which has been kind of like, you can tell there's been something wrong with him throughout the game. It's something that they. They hint that there is something, but not what the something is. Like, uh, okay, that's not... I, I don't hate it, but it, it wasn't something I was like, whoa, this is amazing. I'm like, 
oh, okay, I guess we're doing this. Uh, the stuff with Walter and Ren, I, as I said, I loved that. That was wonderful. I'm saying lovely a lot because a lot of, like, Kuro can be, despite being the edgy game, because it is, it can also be so damn pleasant. So, like, I think it's, most of the finale is pleasant and the bad, not even the bad stuff. I think the weakest parts are fine. But I do have to talk about the game's edginess. Like I've said, a lot of sex jokes. This game has a lot of just death. Even in uh, like some of the side quests. There's literally a side quest where you try to stop a guy from committing suicide. And I think it's regardless of what you say, if you're like really hard on him or really nice to him, he, he won't do it either way. But like, wow, that is literally a side quest. Okay. There's one where this woman's like, hey, my, uh, my fiance disappeared. And I, he went on, like, some dangerous mission for, like, the thugs he was working with, and I haven't heard from him since. Can you investigate this? And you do, and you find out that, yes, he died. And his last will was, if, like, don't tell her. It will hurt her way more to know that I am dead, so please just tell her I left her for some other woman, because I think that'll make it easier for her to, like, to live with. And you get the decision. What do you tell her? Do you tell her the truth? Or do you honor his last will and lie to her? And I'm going to be honest. I told her the truth. I thought that was the better option. And the game doesn't really tell you which is the better option. You get to pick. And I really liked that. I quite liked the morality system in this game. And just some of the choices it allowed me to make. Especially with the Amalta members. It's, do you want to kill them or not? It was really up to you. No one is going to judge you for killing these people. What do you think is best here? I I really liked that. Uh, just kind of looking to see if I have anything else to really say. No, that's really it. Uh, so I think that is it about the story. So I would say with all of my problems with the narrative... It's a four and a half because I really don't have many problems. It's just, I don't like some of the writing. Again, I think it can be too horny at times. I think it can be too edgy at times. I think it can be, I don't like the slut shaming towards Judith. That is the biggest part of the writing I don't like. But with everything else being so fucking excellent, I can only take off half a point for that. I'm going to be honest. I love the main cast so much. And I just... A lot of the individual chapters, even if I'm like, this chapter was okay, it's nothing that I really feel like I should take points off for. And the others are like such bangers, or there's, like chapter one, I think is fine overall, but such a good ending. You're like, man, there's like something great everywhere here with the story. So to me, that's an easy four and a half. So overall, in conclusion, it's four and a half, four and a half, which is eight, Wait, no, I'm retarded, sorry. That's nine, because you have to add up the halves, and then another three and a half, twelve and a half overall. Which I'm going to be honest, lo a little lower than I expected. But that's because I'm a bit harsh on the gameplay. Which is still fun, and I think is very important for me to say, but that last impression with the final chapter, I did not care for. Gonna be completely honest about that. If I found the final chapter to be less boring... Or the final boss to be less ass, this would get a higher score 100%. But overall, 12.5 out of 5, excellent game. Definitely, I feel like one of my favorite Trails games. I think so far of the ones I have ranked, it is the second highest. Um, I'm not exactly sure which one I want to do next. I kind of want to do a Sky game because I haven't yet. <laughs> So I feel like next is probably going to be Sky the Third, but if it's not, we'll know when we know.